Good afternoon. I'm David Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome our viewing audience to today, today's panel discussion, Voices from Ukraine, Reflections on War. Nearly three weeks ago, we had a panel, panel discussion on Russian and Ukraine, the politics of resentment. There we had scholarly and professional insights into Russia's war with Ukraine. Our objective was to understand the situation from diverse perspectives. The feedback we received was that as helpful as that panel was, it's also important to listen to various perspectives from people deeply knowledgeable of the actual situation. Ideally, to hear from people who are from Ukraine or who have spent significant time there. This feedback led to today's panel program, which brings to the discussion informed perspectives from people who know Ukraine like the backs of their hands. Our objective today is to gain greater empathy as well as understanding of the concerns, the insights, and the hopes of people from Ukraine as they themselves strive to understand the complex developments of this terrible war. Let me first introduce the people who are facilitating this. I'm David Schmidt. I'm the moderator of this uh, session. Kicking it off, I'm the director of the Patrick J. Wade Center for Applied Ethics, and I'm an associate professor of business ethics in the Dolan Business School. Joining me is Catherine Nance, who is the moderator of the Q&A portion of this program at the end of our panel. She is a professor of economics, also in the Dolan School of Business. I'd like now to introduce our four panelists. We were able to pick up a fourth panelist right at the, the last minute, and I'm delighted. Uh, I will introduce them now in the order in which they will be speaking on the panel. Yana Shapilo, who is a Fulbright scholar from Ukraine. She is currently at the University of Maryland College Park. Formerly, Yana worked with the America Councils program uh, in Ukraine, uh, which was um, managing the academic integrity project that Kathy and I were involved with. Jaroslav Grigachuk, Deputy Business Ombudsman in Kyiv, also has extensive government relations and public policy and professional experience. Uh, he's an attorney and he was our last minute addition and we're delighted to have him join us. Natalia Goshalik, also a Fulbright, Fulbright visiting professor from Ukraine. She is at the University of California in Berkeley. She's an associate professor at the Vasil Stefanik Precarpathian National University in Ukraine. And coming back to join us again from the last panel is Conrad Turner. Uh, he is retired. He served as the Minister Counselor of the Foreign Service of the United States of America. And we had met him when he uh, was just finishing up his tour in Ukraine. He was the uh, sponsor and the mover behind the Academic Integrity Project that I've mentioned. So we have um, four informed, deeply committed and involved uh, persons who can speak to this. I would also note, I hope, that, I hope our audience is noted, we have people here all the way from California to the Western region of Ukraine. So geographically, we are diverse. I would like to now turn over to Yana, who will begin with her opening comments for the panel discussion. Yana, you have the floor. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for inviting us today. Um, I'm grateful to Fairfield University uh, for giving us a platform to voice our ideas and thoughts. As David mentioned correctly, I've been working, uh, I had been working at American Councils for seven years, uh, and I would rather tell you about academic integrity successes uh, that we managed to receive during those seven years. I would rather share with you my experience, my pleasure of working with Catherine Nance and David Schmidt as they were visiting Ukraine for more than, I think, five times. I would rather share our successes that we've developed with 
universities in Ukraine as we were working on uh, higher education reform. But unfortunately, uh, I am here to tell you that uh, my team, uh, people that I've been working with for my during my seven years of uh, career uh, with American Council, my team is now all over Ukraine and abroad because of the war that was started by Russia uh, back in 2014, not almost nine, nine, nine years ago, but escalated uh, on February 24th, 2022. And we've been living since that time, day and night, praying that our dear friends, that our relatives, that our colleagues, our neighbors, people we've met and we've never met before are safe and alive. They are not safe and they cannot be safe anywhere. Some of my colleagues are now in Poland because they had to flee the country to save their lives. One of my colleagues is now in Kherson with her mother under occupation. She's afraid she's uh, a tremendous, brave young girl, young woman. She's a great professional. Uh, she believes in Ukraine, she stands with Ukraine, but she and her mom are trying to do their best to survive under the Russian occupation of her son. Another colleague of mine serves in the army. He joined the army voluntarily to fight for Ukraine instead of reforming higher education in Ukraine. So many of my, of my colleagues and friends I've been reaching out and uh, I've been reaching out to them to make sure that they are safe. But the issue here is that even though they can be safe right now, we cannot be sure that they are safe in two minutes. One of my colleagues is in Kyiv right now, in the suburbs of Kyiv with her family. And they refuse to leave their hometown. They want to stay in Kyiv. But they are under the constant shellings from Russians hiding in the bomb shelters as we speak right now, as we have a pleasure of warm water, of electricity, of the internet, of our coffee, uh, of grocery stores being open, of pharmacies being open, of yesterday's Oscar that nominated and announced the best movies, the best actresses and actors. These are the pleasures of the world in the 21st century that now my people in Ukraine cannot enjoy. I've been living in Ukraine for my whole life. My parents are there right now. My brother is there right now. Uh, they had two sirens today. So that was a good day, a calm day. We're hoping for the night to be calm as well because it's the most scariest, I would say, uh, periods of the time. But as people have been asking us, I think a lot, why the war started and what has Putin in his mind, uh, I think it's important to say that we've been living on, we, we, we've been experiencing a very long history of Russian occupation. Even the world, Russia, even the name of the country, Russian Federation, was actually stolen and established in 1721. Before that, they were calling themselves Moscow Empire. That's what the country name was and still is. Rus, Russia, the, the word that they used to call themselves right now, Kievan Rus was actually uh, established by Ukrainians uh, with the capital in Kyiv. Kyiv was founded in 482. Moscow was founded in 1147, so almost 600 years after Kyiv. In 1721, uh, Tsar Peter the Great, as they call him, he renamed the state. He called it Russian Empire to appropriate the name and to appropriate the history. And they've been doing that ever since. The legend of Crimea being part of Russia, historical part of Russia, is also a myth and a lies because in 1944, 
almost 200,000 Crimean Tatars were deported from Crimea in just three days. So many of them died. They were reported to, deported to Uzbekistan. And Crimea and Russian people were sent to live in Crimea. And I not only know that from the history, I also know that because a friend of mine who is in, from Crimea, she's from Yalta, her grandmother, who is now almost 90, she was the Russian who was sent to live in Crimea. She was the Russian who now lives in the house that used to belong to Crimean Tatars. And my friend right now is in Italy. Her, parent, her parents had to flee Crimea after Russia occupied it in 2014 because they, they were never safe there. They could not uh, continue their education. They have a young son. Uh, they had, had used to have business there, so they had to flee. But what I'm saying here is that Russian Federation, or I would better say Moscow Federation, has been appropriating the history of this region for a very long time. And I would like us to remember that uh, as we will be talking about and having this conversation next. To get back to uh, the history of Ukraine and Russia and to what is happening right now, I've been hearing that this is the genocide of Ukrainian people. And we've looked through the genocide created by Russians, created by Stalin, by Soviet empire in 1932-33. Uh, part of my family on my father's side died during the Holodomor. Our lands, because my great grandparent, he was considered to be rich. He had three cows. He had three cows and four horses. So Soviets took the cow horses and took the, the, the cows, took their land, and they were forced to flee and look for a place to stay and for a place to live and to survive. My family on my mother's side, they were from Poland. And I learned that when I was 14, because my grandmother, who was half Polish, never told that before. She was so afraid to tell that because her father was sent to Siberia just because he was Poland, Polish. And when Soviet Union was created and when Soviets occupied Ukrainian lands in 1917, they not only forced Ukrainian people to move, they were deported and sent all over the region. They also were forcing out Polish people. It was not safe to be Polish. It was not safe to speak Polish, the same as it was not safe to speak Ukrainian. So here I am with no idea where my great grandfather was buried, with no idea where so many of my relatives on my mother's side are. And here I am living for the 30, with, with the thought for 34 days already that I was the one to call my parents, wake them up at 5.30 in the morning to tell them that the war started. I was the one to wake up my friends in Ukraine to tell them that the war started. And I was the one to make sure that they have time, that they have anything at all, that they have news because they were asleep. And we in the United States, we were awake. So what I'm saying here, and I'm begging here to our audience here and all over the country is to be awake and to stay awake because peace, if we want to live in peace, we need to have the strength to fight for it. We need to stay awake because the world right now is facing one of the most horrible, I think, uh, per pages in our history. And if we want to have peace, I urge you to, start, to stand with Ukraine and to listen to what we have to say, to listen to what our government has to say and to believe in good and to believe in what, in what uh, we in Ukraine strongly believe in, to believe in Ukraine and that it's going to win. Thank you. And David. Jano, thank you very much for your heartfelt and vivid remarks. 
Um, I would like to remind our viewers that as you're listening to our speakers, I know that you're bound to be having questions or some thoughts coming to you. Uh, please note them to us in the Q&A facility of this program. Post your thoughts in the Q&A and Kathy, my colleague, will be collecting them and be sharing them with the, uh, uh, with the speakers at the end of our program. I would like now to transition to our second speaker, Yaroslav, uh, who is, uh, has professional and journalistic and legal experience, policymaking experience, uh, brings a very uh, seasoned uh, perspective to this topic. I'd like to turn the panel over to you, Yaroslav, and for you to share us your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Um, kind of similarly to the manner in which uh, Jana started, I uh, wish I could share with you success we have here in uh, Ukraine in uh, institutional creativity, building up a uh, 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 multi-stakeholder uh, specialized ombudsman institution specifically designed to enable businesses to resolve uh, their grievances with uh, in uh, relations with uh, public authorities in a pre-trial manner. And uh, we've been actually pretty good in doing that since uh, May 2015, when we've been established, uh, thanks to the joint uh, effort uh, of the government of Ukraine, that appointed myself to this role uh, and uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, OECD, and five large local business associations, which proves that in the conditions of uh, uh, Slavic, uh, post-Soviet jurisdiction, if you create institutions uh, that possess sufficient uh, reputational leverage, you can achieve uh, even better results on the operational level than the traditional courts can bring. And that in the environment where traditionally we've been criticized for the proper observance to the rule of law. But yes, the subject that brought us all together is uh, uh, totally different. Uh, it's uh, the uh, ongoing war that has been uh, um, uh, brutally started by the uh, Russian Federation against uh, uh, Ukraine. And um, uh, what I would like to uh, bring also to uh, Yana's prior uh, uh, comprehensive historical uh, journey back into the um, uh, uh, historical preconditions uh, that makes uh, uh, our uh, nations uh, uh, different. Uh, I would like to emphasize on the two uh, things that um, uh, a key for me to uh, describe the object, when I'm thinking about the uh, Putin's objective while pursuing this, and the second, uh, why it actually happened. When it comes to the first thing, again, the quick uh, personal uh, story that I might say is that uh, my, uh, uh, father is originally from Transcarpathia, mother from uh, Cherkasse. They are all now uh, uh, not uh, with us uh, anymore. Uh, my wife is from the northern part of uh, uh, Ukraine, from Chernigiv uh, area, which is now being heavily bombarded. Uh, in our family, we speak Ukrainian, we identify ourselves as uh, Ukrainians, and the way I, being here on the ground, uh, when I am attempting to in interpret uh, intellectually or even get a sense um, through, through my feelings, through my soul, uh, uh, what, what is the objective of the war, it's ultimately uh, for uh, Putin to uh, um, convince me that the manner in which I identify myself and my family doesn't make any sense, that I do not exist, 
that Ukrainians do not exist. That, that such a nation is uh, some sort of a subset of a greater, uh, allegedly greater Ru Russian nation. And this um, imperialistic uh, component, which was being forged in Russia for uh, many years, is uh, the underlying non-tangible element that explains even the level of atrocities and this hatred that we uh, observe all over the country. When we are bombarded, when there are some shell bombing, children killed, paternity houses uh, destroyed, schools, universities, theaters, for goodness sake. And now about the reason why it might have happened. There are some universal recipes that this world developed in order to help uh, this avoid or considerably uh, decrease the likelihood of uh, such scenarios happening. And that's yet another journey into where Ukrainians are different from uh, Russians. Both uh, apparently uh, appeared as a pretty much uh, uh, similar, mentally very, very similar, language speaking, uh, uh, sharing uh, the same uh, Russian language in certain parts after the breakup of the former Soviet Union. But where Ukrainians proved that they are inherently different as a nation and proved themselves as a nation from Russians is the tradition of democracy. Uh, right now, regardless of all criticism that we are exposed to, allegations of corruption, problems with the role of law, etc., the current Ukrainian president since the Ukrainians' independence, is the sixth incumbent. Six. We had Krauchuk, Kuchma, Yushchenko, Yanukovych, Poroshenko, and now, probably as a slap into Putin's face, a former comic, Volodymyr Zelensky, who proves to be the one who is doing a very good job. And that proves that regardless of, uh, I'm just taking the last uh, uh, political uh, cycle in the Ukrainian, in Ukraine. Um, yes, I, I have to finish. Uh, but the Ukrainian political history is that despite of all the internal hatred, Poroshenko passed the power to the newly incumbent. In Russia, the same guy runs for 22 years. And the last thing that I would like to emphasize, and I'm hopeful we will be able to attend to this as well, is that what is happening is that it shows that the breakup of the former Soviet Union proved, when we are referring to Budapest Memorandum, how infantile the approach was to uh, attending uh, the and building up uh, security uh, uh, infrastructure. The current event basically proves that it's absent. And the need, uh, and the current situation calls for two things a very serious guarantees of the Ukrainian uh, sovereignty, maybe with neutrality, but with the uh, uh, fully uh, uh, legally binding obligation on the part of the main nations who are guaranteeing. Uh, democracy around the world, first of all, uh, United Nations and United Kingdom. And second, we need a very tangible help now, because otherwise we will not survive in the medium term. Weapons, sophisticated, and much, much more. Air missile, planes, etc. Crucial thing. And sorry if I overtook a bit of my time. You were you're fine on your time, uh, and I know that you have you, you've shared a message which I'm confident is raising some very important thoughts and questions that we will come back to you with in our discussion. We, we'll be talking with you more. Let me now turn to Natalia. Um, 
I've introduced her to you as the visiting Fulbright professor out there in sunny California. Uh, I want you to know that uh, Natalia is a, is a very impressive scholar and writer. Uh, Kathy and I worked with her in a writing workshop on academic integrity, and she clearly was one of the uh, very thoughtful members of that group. So I'm very pleased that she can be with us today to share her thoughts. Natalia, I'd like to turn the floor over to you, if I may, please. Thank you so much, dear David. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for organizing this panel and thank you all for coming and uh, and thank you for your interest in the topic and interest to Ukraine. Uh, so, um, I, as you know, I am a visiting professor right now at University of California here in Berkeley. And I actually came to work here last October. I came to work on social media and sustainability and to identify and to research the a way uh, the construction of eco identity of Americans is going on, especially with the focus on social media. Uh, these are my uh, this is my focus of interest, primarily focus of interest. But right now, I'm using media and social media for another purpose. I'm using it for raising the awareness about Ukraine. So far, I've had about 10 interviews with local media here in Berkeley, and I'm so grateful to this community for the, their interest in the uh, current situation. So what do we have right now? Let's have a closer look because um, we know that more than one month, one month has passed and we can like st step back, look back and see the whole picture of it, or at least try to see. So Russia invaded a free and independent Ukraine over a month ago. And Russia has committed uh, atrocious war crimes that cannot be allowed to continue. Putin's regime is intent on destroying Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And that is the worst thing that's happening because right now I am as a Ukrainian person, as a Ukrainian, and all Ukrainian people uh, in Ukraine and all, all over the world, we are saying that Putin's regime is destroying Ukrainians, not only Ukraine, but Ukrainian people in particular. Uh, because what we see on the ground in Ukraine, we see that Putin, Russia's army, they have deliberately shelled civilian targets. They have, um, they have uh, shelled schools, hospitals, and they have murdered thousands of civilians. And I'm sure that uh, there, um, there isn't a Ukrainian right now in Ukraine who has not had either friends or relatives who have suffered or unfortunately have been killed as I am uh, as well. And, the parents of my friends and uh, people I know, they have suffered and they have been killed uh, in this war. Uh, right now we have uh, seen that Russian's army has uh, targeted cities like Mariupol, Kharkiv, Kyiv and more and starving people uh, of basic human uh, needs like water, food and worms. Uh, they have executed civilians, they have kidnapped thousands of civilians, and unfortunately they have sent them to camps uh, in Russia, and unfortunately after sending them to camps in Russia, they are using them for creating their own media story and for creating the, the, the image of Ukraine as uh, they see it. Uh, in their own uh, world view, distorted world view. Uh, so many Ukrainians, we see that so many Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes and Russian's army, they have sent millions of refugees into Poland, into Hungary, into Europe and not only. And we may sum up it all in one uh, sentence. Uh, so, uh, Russian army has terrorized all of Ukraine, that is a country of over 
40 million people. So that could be compared to the size of Texas or maybe California even. Uh, terror and genocide are the key words we have to remember when we are talking about what Russia's army is doing. Uh, but uh, as a Ukrainian and as a person who uh, has, um, who is in contact, like all Ukrainians here, I, I would guess, uh, all over the world, we are uh, staying in contact with our relatives and friends uh, every hour, every 15 minutes. And we are always, we feel responsibility of representing their perspective here. So I want us to look, to have a closer look at what Ukrainians are doing on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians uh, are forced to fight for their country, their state, uh, because they are not going to surrender. And everyone is definite about that. All the experts, all the military experts, or all the political experts, everyone. That, that has been a surprise, I guess. But right now, that's uh, something that everyone understands. And that's the conscious choice of Ukrainians, not to surrender, but to fight. Uh, my colleagues from various fields, from the university, from the nonprofit organization that I've been working uh, with uh, recently, they have picked up a role in this war. Some are fighting at the front line. Uh, some have joined the territorial defense units. These are local defense units who are protecting the uh, cities and towns and villages. And uh, they are also helping the, those who are at the front lines as well. Some are volunteering and trying to collect money and all the necessary supplies starting from bulletproof vests and helmets and, uh, and food and so on. So whenever help is needed, whatever kind of help is needed, volunteers are there and they are helping. Uh, some are working, like my sister is. Uh, they are doing their jobs. My sister is a part of the governmental public service sector. Uh, she is uh, helping people to get their ID documents, and she has right now she has more work than ever with people coming from all over Ukraine uh, and uh, with the need of uh, of this governmental of the help from the governmental institutions. She's in the Western Ukraine, and she feels this responsibility of representing a country. And she is staying in Ukraine to do her job uh, because, uh, and that is definitely also her conscious choice. Uh, my colleagues are doing their jobs at universities. They are organizing uh, international seminars and lectures. Uh, I will show you uh, um, a, a story from besieged Kherson where I also have colleagues and for uh, you know that uh, Kherson is right now has no connection, so it is surrounded by the Russian army, and people in Kherson they are deprived of so many things. But people from Kherson State University they have managed uh, to organize a series of webinars with colleagues from Europe and US. So in besieged Kherson. Uh, not having enough uh, or having some problems with food, medicine, and so on. But fortunately enough, having internet connection, they are doing their jobs. They are connecting colleagues and students and uh, international professionals. And they are trying to raise their voices and to uh, stay sane and stay active and proactive under these circumstances. Uh, right now, let's have a closer look at what Ukrainians in US and all over the world are doing. So I guess that um, our task is uh, to persuade more people all over the globe to do the same, to choose an active role and act. Uh, Ukrainians ask that American people and people all over the globe continue to stand by Ukraine 
and uh, work and act for Ukraine. What can we do? You may contact the representatives, you may contact the uh, White House and uh, so express that you support Ukraine and that matters so much because no business as usual, no communication as usual. And finally, I want to say that Ukraine has become the greatest discovery of the 21st century, but not to leave it on the level of information and just me as part of interest together with the international allies, like all of you right now, because I think that I believe that and I know that you are our allies, we have to help this fight for freedom and fight for democ democracy. And uh, we have to ask to support Ukraine with military resources and further economic sanctions. This support combined with the Ukrainian army and people's courageous resistance will help Ukraine uh, win and prevail uh, this war. Thank you so much, David. Natalia, thank you very much for your message. It's vivid and it gives us a lot to think about and I'm sure we will discuss. We'll turn now to our final panelist, Conrad Turner, uh, who we're happy to have back with us, not only because he uh, has spent significant time in Ukraine as a diplomatic professional, but he has had global experience, which I won't take time here to summarize, but trust me that this, this person has worked um, around the world and so brings a global perspective to our discussion as well. Conrad, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm uh, looking at this map and realizing that I have been to uh, all of the uh, regional capitals, I think, uh, except for Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, when I was there, it was just after the, the uh, Maidan revolution and Russia had uh, invaded Ukraine. In fact, Ukraine has been at war since then. This was uh, uh, 2013, 2014. And uh, the world wasn't quite sure what to do about it. And uh, frankly, we didn't, uh, we didn't do enough. Uh, War has been raging in Donetsk and Luhansk, and of course Crimea was was summarily taken. Uh, you, the the word annex is uh, uh, is used as a euphemism, uh, but it was stolen. Uh, and here we are today. The whole country is is under siege, uh, but Ukrainians are fighting very bravely. Uh, and very stubbornly in, a, in the most positive sense you can imagine, I can, I will get to that in a minute. Um, I, listening to others talk, I was reminded of a conversation I had with an ambassador a, a few years ago about a country, an unnamed country that, that had uh, European Union aspirations. And we were debating what it was to be European in the European Union sense. And the conclusion, at least that I came to, was that uh, you decide you are European, and you decide that you uh, believe in European values, and you decide that you're you're at peace with your neighbors, and that you uh, want all the benefits of cooperation. And uh, that was the uh, that was the Ukraine I arrived at. And by the way, that does not describe Russia. And we can all hope that one day that will change, uh, but it's it doesn't appear to be anywhere on the horizon. Uh, so, if you would please imagine. You're a, an American diplomat who served in, I guess it must have been eight, eight or nine countries at the time. Uh, I had been in um, working with non-governmental organizations all over the world, uh, helping to build democratic institutions and seeing a lot of people fight very bravely and not succeeding uh, uh, in their various uh, dictatorships. Um, you arrive in Ukraine and I, I arrived there and I realized I was looking at the real thing. This was a lot of people who were very eager to make this country work. They had just cast off a corrupt president and uh, young people, and by young, I mean everybody from age 20 something to uh, 50 something had moved into, had given up um, jobs in banking jobs in business, they were making good money, they gave up jobs to move into the government to, 
to make this new democratic experiment work. And, uh, and above all, their goal was to get rid of corruption because that was, that was the big, as I understood it, the big problem that everybody was looking at. They were angry about it and they saw the European Union as, as a way to uh, escape the corruption that was frankly closely associated with Russia, uh, with, with Moscow. Uh, so there's a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of uh, arguing, a lot of complaining, uh, doing all the good things that you see in a good, uh, lively democracy. And um, uh, I left having, feeling like I had experienced, I, I had never experienced anything like this. Um, we had, uh, the people we were working with knew what they wanted to do. I had meetings with um, educators leaders who had clear ideas of what they were trying to achieve uh, and maybe were looking for ideas on how to how to how to get there uh, I left sadly I left some very good friends I came back a few years later and I heard people still arguing uh, still complaining and yet I saw a country that had moved dramatically forward uh, Ukraine is European I'm saying that as somebody who's in a European country right now, Ukraine is European. Ukraine wants all the things that Western, so quote unquote, Western Europe wants. Um, and there's something else too, uh, uh, Natalia alluded to it. Uh, Ukraine doesn't give up and won't give up. And uh, for people who are planning around events in Ukraine, remember this, Ukrainians will not give up. Um, there was something there, you could argue, all along, but something about the Maidan revolution uh, solidified that sense of putting the past behind them. And that's not just putting, putting the past of, uh, of a corrupt government behind them, but putting back, uh, putting stale um, historical lies behind them and looking to the future. And frankly, having a, 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 a very clear sense of what democracy is. I, sometimes I worry that in the West, we're too comfortable. We were too happy with our TV and, and or Netflix and, and uh, our lives and so forth. And we seem to be getting away from uh, what it means to be in a democracy. And a democracy it is a commitment, really. And that's what you're seeing across Ukraine now. And you're seeing with our panelists today, uh, they may or may not be in Ukraine, but they are fighting for Ukraine. Uh, given that Ukraine is not going to give up, uh, I will uh, quote uh, someone else. Uh, I think it was uh, Yana who said, stay awake, don't blink, uh, keep the pressure on. Uh, it, it's very tempting, especially as the Kremlin gets the propaganda machine back online, which it will, uh, it's very important to keep this pressure on. It is good pressure. Yes, it's hard. It's hard on the Russian people as it must be. Uh, we also need to keep the momentum away from Russian gas. And I would argue from fossil fuels in general, that's another old story that we really need to put behind us. But let me, let me come back to the question of Kremlin propaganda. Uh, it's, I'm spending much of my time painting a house and, and to my chagrin, spilling a lot of paint. And propaganda, Russian propaganda is kind of like paint. It, when, when it spills, it's going to keep filling every little crevice until it, until it dominates. And while it's tempting to, to listen very carefully to what Putin is saying and what his opinions are saying, uh, what's coming across official propaganda challenges, it's far more important to stay the course uh, uh, and not give in to um, where, frankly, Western democratic politics may take us, which is away from the subject, uh, return to normal. Um, uh, the desire to do business again. We can't let that happen. This is a real opportunity to do the right thing for the United States and for Europe. And lastly, uh, and 
at this point, I think it's not too early to talk about post-war Ukraine. Ukraine will have been through a lot. And yes, Ukraine is going to need help building, rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding residential housing. We've seen the photos, they're real. That's what's happening there. People have lost their homes. We also need to think about uh, the trauma that uh, people are experiencing, young people who may not be able to express it the same way others are, children. Think about how we can address their traumas so that they can come out in a good place once we get past the conflict. Uh, and finally, uh, two really important points. One is uh, Russian money, uh, Kremlin money, let's put it that way, like Kremlin propaganda, tends to seep in wherever it can. It's really important to make sure that Ukraine is able to stand without corrupt money coming in. It's a very difficult fight, but everything we can possibly do to prevent that from happening is important. And lastly, uh, and education always somehow ends up being last in a list. I would like to put it first, and perhaps my, my scholarly colleagues would agree. Uh, we need to help Ukraine rebuild its schools, uh, its university buildings, but also get its classrooms back functioning as best as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. What I'd like, we've now heard from our four panelists. I'm gonna take down the share screen. Uh, so uh, it should be possible for all of our panelists now to be on the screen for our audience. Because what we wanna do now is to move into a discussion. And the way I'd like to start this discussion is I'd like to invite my panel, panelists to see if they, they have anything they would like to add now that they've heard their fellow panelists. I know every time I'm on a panel discussion, as I listen to others, I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had said this, or I wanna to respond to that. So let me quickly move through the panelists in the order in which they spoke to see if there's anything that you would like to add to the group at this time. And if you don't, you can just say, I pass for now, that would be fine. But we'll do this for a little bit, and then we will turn uh, over to the broader q and I've been watching, uh, as questions have been coming in, and we, and we will save time for them. So, Yana, having heard the whole panel, is there anything else you would like to add or, or to ask of your fellow panelists at, at this point? Thank you, David. I actually wanted to add and thank Conrad for mentioning education. As a person that's been working in education, been working with Conrad for a long time, I think education is a very important topic to talk about here. And not only do we need to rebuild our schools and to rebuild our universities, some of them are totally destroyed as like Sumu campus or Kharkiv campus. And I believe David and Catherine, you visited Kharkiv campus and yep. you were given lectures there. So not only do we need to rebuild and support Ukrainian education system, I think what we also need to do in the United States is to include Ukraine as a topic of discussion in academia because for a very long time uh, all the information was gathered around Russian studies and there is nothing wrong with Russian studies but the irony here is that all the academics that have been researching Russia for a very long time are now silenced because they cannot uh, get in peace in what is happening right now and they cannot explain what is happening right now there is nothing uh, to uh, be enrooted in what they've been working on for a long time. But what we also see is the lack of Ukrainian experts in the field who can speak about Ukrainian history, Ukrainian language, Ukrainian genocides, uh, Ukrainian perspectives, Ukrainian successes, and so more and so forth. And even though we are doing our best here to include that into the conversation, I'm just using this platform as I know that so many people are listening to us right now, so many people from academy. Uh, please think about that and please make sure that uh, when you cite somebody, you can cite Ukrainian. When you work on some topic, you can think it, about it from the Ukrainian perspective or include it. This is, this is important. 
uh, because we are trying to get back to rebuild, but also to give voices to Ukrainian scientists all over the world. And some of them cannot speak for themselves. As we know, uh, at least five, five scientists were killed uh, during this last uh, month. So I guess we are here responsible not only for ourselves, but for people who are not with us anymore. So education is not only about reading and writing. Education is about gathering people, uh, creating the common platform. And I think this is the time uh, to do that uh, around the globe. So thank you, uh, Conrad, for mentioning that. And thank you, David, for- Thank you, Yana. Chance. Thank you so much. Yaroslav, do you have anything now that you want to add having heard your colleagues on the panel? Uh, I just uh, uh, maybe following up on where, uh, picking up where I left it off. Yes, uh, uh, given how dramatic the military uh, uh, um, element of this uh, situation and how important it is. It poses challenges to the manner in which here in Ukraine, we perceive the efficiency of the Western democracy. Uh, uh, democracy works when incumbent listen and are uh, uh, capable to promptly uh, respond to uh, public opinions and the overwhelming public opinion in the Western world is to give tangible help to Ukraine. And uh, uh, if uh, some of those 29 meek uh, jet, uh, jet fighters uh, uh, will not arrive or a good air defense system will not uh, arrive, uh, then uh, uh, dear colleagues, with all respect, we might not necessarily reach the point when we will have a privilege to talk about education. Okay. Let's uh, not underestimate the uh, significance of uh, this uh, uh, military component and this tangible help. And again, uh, because of the failure of uh, uh, of Budapest Memorandum, uh, the big lessons uh, for Ukraine, uh, our negotiators, uh, I'm hopeful, will uh, do everything possible in order to incorporate necessary covenants in order, as I said again, to make this uh, us safe uh, for us Ukrainians to continue living in this country. Uh, so that the new arrangement uh, uh, shall be reached. The failure of uh, Budapest Memorandum, uh, and you know who signatories are. This is not only Russia who has uh, uh, unilaterally breached it by first uh, invading Crimea, and after that uh, being bold enough to quote on CNN uh, with their uh, main spokesperson that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, attempts to uh, breach the neutrality uh, uh, that has been proclaimed from the outset. My question, of course, is of course, who has done it first? But the breach of uh, the failure of Budapest Memorandum imposes a big moral and political obligation on the Western world to uh, help Ukraine tangibly and actually preserve the uh, democratic values to stop this plog from spreading elsewhere in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Okay. Don't uh, let the uh, uh, Western politicians uh, reach that state of uh, play when uh, the Article 5 of NATO would have to be tested in practice. No one knows in between us how this is going to happen in reality. That's a Thank serious you. warning to us, Yaroslav. Thank you for your insights on that. Let me turn to Natalia. Having heard everyone, would you like to add anything at this point? 
Just a very short message. Thank you, David. Uh, on the ground in Ukraine, everything is very clear. So there is good and there is evil. There is black and there is white. It's like a fairy tale. Only in fairy tales, miracles happen. Yeah, But in real life, people make miracles happen. We become Santa Claus, we bring presents. So people make miracles. So here, right now, I want to come back to the words, to the quote that I heard from retired General McCarthy and who said that to prevail, to win this war, Ukraine needs game-changing technology. So I want to emphasize this and to make this miracle happen, we need help with uh, game-changing technology. So once we get this, that will be a game-changing uh, situation for the whole world. Thanks. Thank you, Natalia. Conrad, any last thoughts before we turn over to the uh, broader discussion? Uh, yeah, at the, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, it's really important that uh, Ukraine get what it's what it needs to to fight this fight. Uh, it's it's unfortunate, but it's the truth. Uh, if we can't provide planes, uh, we need to we cannot be guilty of a failure of imagination. I, I would just put it that way. Get them what they need. They know how to use it. They will use it well. Thank you so much. Uh, if you will indulge me just for a second, I would like to just say that um, I was struck how each and every one of you was so eager to share with us the positive things about Ukraine, the good news, the successes of Ukraine. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We, we, we came here to talk about the problem. But I would like to acknowledge that I think all Americans, as we have watched this war unfold and we have witnessed the heroic, the word stubborn was used, um, uh, the resolute and unwavering response of the Ukrainians to this Goliath-like threat. I mean, we as a country stand in awe and deep respect for this nation that we're learning so much about. And I think this conversation has just been a, at least a small contribution to that mutual learning and conversation that needs to happen. Kathy, I know that you've been tracking the um, questions as they come in from our audience. I have a few notes I could still refer to, but I'd like to, you know, as far as picking up on the conversation just now, I'll hold them in reserve if we need them. Let me turn to you and have you facilitate some conversation around our virtual input. Thanks so much, David, and thanks so much to all of our, our panelists for their really um, forthright and, and moving at times um, uh, presentations. I think um, we need to, to have both of those perspectives um, to, as Yaroslav said, you know, sort of trying to intellectually get our heads around what's happening and to also emotionally feel um, what it means uh, to, to uh, be at war. So I appreciate both of those, those um, perspectives. I, I'll just say one quick thing before I, I uh, have identified a couple of strands of questions from our um, our Q&A uh, board. And so I'll come, come back to those in just a minute. But I, I remember the first, maybe the second trip that David and I took to Ukraine. Um, we went towards the Eastern um, edge of, of the country and we traveled uh, not only to Kharkiv, but also to Sumy. Um, incredible hospitality we received there. I think uh, it was there that in Sumy that I learned about uh, Ukrainian tradition that um, at mealtime, when you have guests, every bit of the table needs to be covered with plates um, because there needs to be enough food so that none of the table shows um, as your guests are selecting from amongst a variety of delicious um, things to eat and, and, and just being so uh, humbled by that show of, of hospitality as we were meeting people and working together. But I think one of the things that someone mentioned to me, and it could have been Yana, 
um, as we were in that in that um, in that part of the country, very close to the fighting at the time. Um, this was 2016 or 2017 that we were traveling there, um, and uh, just just hearing that um, sort of if you think Putin is done, you're not paying attention. If you think this annexation of Crimea and now um, invading uh, these Eastern oblasts in our country, you think he's done, you're not paying attention. And that really stuck with me um, in, in terms of the way that I have viewed um, this most recent um, developments and then, and then war. So following up on two strains, and I wanna start with sort of what's happening now and how we got here and then um, I think what a lot of folks in the in the Q and A are asking for, which is what's going to happen, and I don't think any of us can answer that. But but I would I would definitely ask um, for your reflections. So let's start um, with the role of Ukraine in in um, potentially joining NATO, NATO and its com and 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 Ukraine's commitment to neutrality. Um, I think. Uh, it could be that there are others out there who don't know much about this uh, Budapest memora man memorandum. So Yaroslav, if you could just give us a quick minute on what the memorandum um, uh, was intended to guarantee, and then um, how, how uh, uh, Ukraine's move towards the West um, was seen as a real provocation by Putin. Yes, it's uh, the uh, uh, effectively uh, uh, an international document that was uh, signed uh, in early 90s to document uh, Ukrainian abandonment of the third largest nuclear weapon arsenal that we had at that time. Uh, Ukrainian uh, politicians at that time uh, were lured to believe that uh, this very tangible step uh, which is again to abandon uh, in the circumstances when we were made to believe that we are not uh, uh, rich enough to sustain that weapon. And uh, to this large extent, it was true maybe on the economic side. Uh, uh, you know, uh, after the breakup of the former Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine was not on the, from the geopolitical standpoint, in the need to maintain such a large uh, arsenal. But in exchange, we received just uh, effectively a non-binding, uh, generic political statement from the countries who are signatories of uh, uh, Budapest Memorandum, uh, simply stating that they would uh, do everything possible in their good faith. Uh, maybe I'm just paraphrasing, but I'm trying to be substantial here rather than uh, absolute in terms uh, to preserve uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, territorial integrity and, so and sovereignty. And those signatories included uh, United States, France, uh, United Kingdom, uh, maybe, uh, 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 of course, Russian Federation. Uh, and by the way, the uh, answer to one of the questions that I saw in the Q&A, why the Budapest Memorandum uh, is no longer discussed because one of the signatories has uh, uh, abruptly breached it. So uh, that was a complete failure at the part of the uh, uh, way in which uh, international negotiations are supposed to be held. Um, uh, you can criticize professionalism of the uh, uh, quite a juvenile uh, political elite in the newly created Ukraine uh, because the uh, Soviet Union just broke up. But you can similarly criticize the, uh, how genuine and sincere were those uh, uh, signatories uh, who were countersigning the document. Because effectively, as a lawyer, I can say that Ukrainian position to refer to uh, uh, Budapest Memorandum as the ground to actually demand tangible uh, military support now uh, from uh, the actual uh, uh, US or UK army on the ground, it's not completely uh, um, uh, uh, meaningless. 
Thank you so much. That's that's really helpful. I think again, um, I don't think a lot of us um, in the United States know much about that that memorandum, and and so don't understand that the the significance of it. Um, uh, if, if I were just to paraphrase myself, the memorandum uh, again was uh, never meant to become and never became an international treaty in the normal sense. Okay. Thank you. Super, super. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, to Yana for a quick minute and ask a question that relates to this. I think um, you know, again, someone in the um, in the uh, question Q and A asked, "Isn't the commitment to neutrality to forego membership in NATO counterintuitive?" for a people and nation who view themselves as European and pro-Western. Jana, how do you see that, um, especially as we think about um, the move of so many refugees into other parts of Europe? Um, how how um, is this commitment to some sort of neutrality? Was it ever really, I think, a part of the way Ukrainians thought about their relationship to Russia? Thank you, Katie, for rephrasing it this way, because yes, you are absolutely right. We were never neutral in terms of if we want to uh, be a part of Russia, we were very outspoken about that. We were never uh, agreeing to be a part of Soviet Union. We uh, now say that we were occupied by Soviets in 2017. And then in 1945, the Western part of Ukraine was occupied by Soviet Union and NATO and our desires to work with the European Union and be a part of the European community is a part of our constitution. And this is something that uh, a lot of Ukrainians, most of the Ukrainians agree on. But I think that uh, to keep an eye on the ball and not to talk about what's going to happen when we win, because we will win, but all these conversations about neutrality, about whether we should be a part of NATO or should not be a part of NATO. These questions lose their sense if we don't get what we ask for, if we don't get enough supplies uh, of missile defense, enough of planes, because just today, the mayor of Mariupol, the country of 500,000 people, uh, confirmed that at least two 210 kids died. Just yesterday, we had a number of 139 kids all over Ukraine who died. Today, we have 349. Uh, at least 5,000 people in Mariupol died, and that was confirmed by the mayor today. 90% of the city is destroyed right now, and there is hundreds, 170,000 people still under uh, constant shellings from Russia. So if we don't that don't get those missiles, if we don't get those airplanes, uh, we are not going to have a luxury of talking about Ukraine being a neutral, or Ukraine being a part of NATO, or Ukraine being a part of European Union, because people die every day. As we try to philosophize, as we try to entertain ourselves with the. the uh, comfort of discussing what is going to happen in next 10 years or in next five years. There is a good chance that if the world doesn't act right now, if they do not put their money where their promises are, do not put their planes where their stand with Ukraine philosophy stands right now, we will not have this 10 years, we will not have this luxury of discussing what is going to happen next. So I think in terms of Ukrainians being very clear that we are a part of European uh, community, that Ukrainians are being very clear that we are not going to be a part of Russia. This is, as Natalia said, black and white, but everything that is going to happen next depends a lot on what the world responds toward that place. So I'm just trying to make sure that we are thinking about the facts that matter right now and then if when we are lucky to have the luxury, we will be discussing all the results of uh, the, the consequences that follow. Thank you so much, Jana. That 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 is um, absolutely our I think our hope that that somehow um, 
this will end and it will end quickly. Um, but that brings me to, we're, we're running close on time. We've got about four minutes left and I'd like to bring Natalia back in and ask you to um, uh, answer some hard questions. Uh, so what's gonna happen is I think something that I'm seeing all through the q and I know we all want to know that, but as a media expert and as someone who's really been following uh, the, the, the media uh, coverage of, of what's happening, are there, are there any uh, ideas about resolution? How, how might we get to um, uh, some, some sort of um, negotiated way to, to close, close this um, awful, awful chapter of war? So Natalia, if you would um, uh, maybe take that on for, for a minute or two. Sorry okay, to give you yeah, such a hard, yeah, yeah, okay, hard task. Yeah. That's a hard question, but I will approach it from two perspectives. First of all, from the Ukrainian media discourse perspective, because in Ukrainian uh, media and social media discourse, there is, uh, again, this, I would say, uh, this Ukrainian identity, modern Ukrainian identity unfolding, and it's very clear right now. And we are, uh, and people are discussing here the questions of life and death. So life is prevailing, life is winning. So victory, that's the question of life that is discussed. And that's all. So, so far, people are thinking, so they are very cautious in uh, thinking about what will happen after Russians will stop and leave the territory of Ukraine. Because their major questions is for Ukraine to live, yes, for Ukrainians to stay alive. So that is the question that is being discussed in uh, Ukrainian uh, media sphere. Definitely the European uh, American experts, they have more resources to discuss and to go further into these questions. And they have their opinions about negotiating, about the neutral status, about militarization and whatnot. But uh, from my perspective of a Ukrainian, definitely on, uh, I would say it's very important to emphasize this agency of Ukraine. So uh, nothing can be discussed about the status without Ukraine, but without Ukraine, without Ukrainian people and Ukrainian uh, governmental officials. We've got the position of a president right now, and we that may be like the starting point, but we see that Ukrainian president right now is very close and he has tries he tries to keep this close connections with the Ukrainian people. And that's a very positive sign for the Ukrainian society at all, because this might be this starting point for developing and building on further in future. So uh, once Ukraine wins, we will use these resources, yes, this communication channels that have been created so far, and this understanding, this identity that we have created so far, and we will use this as the basis for uh, working on the modern Ukraine. If that answers the question. Oh, I think I think uh, uh, that's that's a great answer because I I do believe what I've heard consistently from all um, uh, of our panelists is the commitment of the Ukrainian people to democracy, to their own um, autonomy, and uh, their their willingness to um, be courageous, uh, so courageous in the face of. Um, such aggression. So uh, very much, I appreciate those those answers, and think we addressed some of the questions that came up in in the in the Q and A. So I'll turn it back to David to close us out. I know that I know that there's more that can be said, and um, we need to have more conversations. I would invite our audience to please um, let the university know if you would like to see more panels. And if there are concerns you would like to address, Kathy and I are very easily reached at the university. I would like to thank all of our panelists for their time and their commitment to this. I, I came out of this with a very clear wake up call. You have called us to be awake and being awake leads to action. I take seriously that you've identified education as just one of the elements of action and I, 
pledge that Fairfield University will do what it can. Thank you to everybody. And on this note, I will adjourn our panel discussion and I wish all of you well. <laughs>